Hi folks, and thank you so much for joining today for What's Preventing Asian Americans from Seeking Mental Health Care. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jen Kearney, and I'm a Digital Communications Manager for McLean Hospital, and I hope wherever you're joining us from in the world, you are doing well. I'm surprised to learn that less than 9% of Asian Americans, on average, are seeking professional help. And I was even more shocked to find out that they're three times less likely to seek help than white Americans. And while I myself am not a member of APAC, I do realize the importance of understanding mental health in all communities, not just the ones that you or I are a part of ourselves, so that we can work on fighting stigma as one. So over the next 50-ish minutes, Dr. Jeffrey Liu is going to discuss mental health in the Asian American community, sharing additional statistics and anecdotes, as well as answering questions about rethinking the ways that we engage with the Asian American population. Whether we're providers to the community, members of the community, friends or loved ones or peers, so that we together can all work to combat stigma. I'd love to take a moment to introduce Dr. Liu. If you are unfamiliar with him, Jeffrey Liu, MD, is an assistant psychiatrist at McLean's Behavioral Health Partial Hospital Program. He's also a member of the faculty at Massachusetts General Hospital's Center for Cross-Cultural Student Emotional Wellness, which is a center that is aimed at creating mental wellness resources for both young Asians and Asian Americans. Additionally, his academic interests include cultural psychiatry, and in particular, the different ways that cultures view dependency. So Dr. Liu, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to join me today, and I'd love for you to take it away. So um, the title of the presentation is called Don't Worry, I'm Fine, Mental Health in the Asian American Population. Um, and it's a topic uh, very near and dear to my heart, and it's a privilege uh, to be able to speak to you about this today. I think it's also a uh, timely topic, um, not only because July is Minority Mental Health Month, but also I think because everything going on in the news, and um, I think it's been on a lot of our minds about how to make our communities, our workplaces more inclusive to all. And so I think for that reason, particularly timely as well. So it's routine to, um, begin these uh, discussions with, oh, let me see, okay. It's routine to begin these discussions with disclosures of conflicts of interest with industry. Uh, I do not have any of those conflicts to disclose. However, I do have some personal disclosures that I would like to disclose. So the first one is um, that I'm a second generation Chinese Canadian. Um, uh, second generation meaning that my parents were born abroad. Um, my dad's from Taiwan, my mom's from Shanghai, um, and they met here and I was born in Canada. Uh, I came to the United States for uh, college. Um, and I consider myself a child, therefore, of three cultures. And you're wondering, oh, three, why? So I consider myself, you know, a child of Chinese heritage. Um, I consider myself a child of sort of mainstream Canadian and then subsequently American culture. Um, but I also consider myself uh, to be sort of a part of a, I'm a psychiatrist. And so I'm also a part of a mental health culture uh, as well. And I'll, I'll allude to this later in my talk. Okay, so um, when I say um, Asian Americans, who am I referring to? So Asian Americans um, are, there are 20 million Asian Americans in the United States. Um, they are 6% of the US population and they are the fastest growing racial group in the United States. They are an incredibly diverse group. Um, they come from over 20 different countries. They comprise hundreds of languages and cultures and I think it's worth pausing here and taking note of this. So I'm going to be talking about Asian Americans as a racial group, um, but that sort of oversimplifies a lot of the diversity within this group. A lot of cultural diversity, um, diversity in language, um, and you might be asking, well, then why talk about this group at, at, as, at, at all? And I think you have a point there, but I think that it's worth starting out here as a starting point, um, as a starting point for some conversations um, and in a, in, a, in a larger understanding of, of, of this group. Asian Americans and mental health. So Asian Americans experience mental health symptoms at approximately similar rates to the general population, um, though it's worth noting that Asian American college-aged youth and particularly Asian American college-aged women are at particularly high risk. 
um, for, for suicide. Um, however, um, despite sort of the approximately similar rates of mental health symptoms, Asian Americans are three times less likely than white Americans to seek care. Put another way, um, uh, estimates show that four in five Asian Americans with probable mental illness do not seek care. That's the highest of any racial group. And just to put that in an analogy, that's like saying like four in five elderly Americans don't seek care for diabetes. This is, this is a huge problem. This is a disparity. Um, and so the main focus of my talk today is going to be, why do Asian Americans not utilize mental health services? And I think you could speculate on a lot of reasons for why this is the case, but I'm going to be focusing on two in my talk. The first one is stigma. And the second one is something I'm calling cultural mismatch, which I'll explain later on. Stigma. What is stigma? So stigma is defined as a mark of disgrace associated with a particular quality. So mental health stigma, that's um, the mark of disgrace associated with um, having a mental illness. And let me be clear, all cultures, all racial groups have stigma. Um, but there's a way that stigma sort of presents itself in the Asian American community that, that might be sort of commenting on in, in a unique way. And to help me do this, I'm gonna actually quote um, Amanda Rosenberg, she's a, 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 a journalist for Vox, and she uh, is biracial, half Chinese, half um, uh, white, and she uh, writes this about her experience with mental illness. For the first 20 years, seven years of my life, I kept my deteriorating mental health under lock and key for one straightforward reason. I was scared of embarrassing my mother. I believed I would be seen as broken or defective and bring shame on my family. Among Asian Americans, there's an expectation to stand out for the right reasons, meaning good grades, a fancy job, high salary, good social standing, and having a husband or wife. In my family's minds, having a mental illness can prevent you from achieving those things. And if you're not achieving everything, then why are you even here? And when I read this quote, this, this quote, um, stung, um, I think because it sort of resonated with me and sort of the way that I grew on, grown up, there's, there's a particular sting of stigma um, within the Asian American community when it comes to mental illness. And I think there are two reasons for this or two sources for stigma within the Asian American community. So one of the sources I think comes from within the Asian American community. And, and some of this has to do with some, um, for some, for some East, uh, for some Asian cultures, um, uh, a, a belief that your value as a person is your value to your family or your community. So this is in contrast to, I guess, sort of more mainstream or sort of white American culture where your value is really your, your individuality, right? Your, your, your job in life is to figure out what you're passionate about, to pursue happiness, to pursue success. Um, in, in some Asian American communities, your value isn't really defined as your value as an individual, but your value to your family or fa your value to your community. And so there's this misconception that mental illness therefore diminishes your value because it takes away, like, a man, like Ms. Rosenberg was saying, from your value and your ability to achieve the things that bring honor and pride to your family. Now, I just want to say, sort of for the record, as a mental health clinician, this is, this is incorrect. It may have been true at one time before treatments existed, but as we know, mental illness largely is very treatable. And folks with mental illness, once they seek treatment, um, live very happy, fulfilling, successful lives. So, so one source of stigma within the Asian American community, I think, has to do with this idea that sort of mental illness handicaps one's ability to achieve in life and therefore diminishes one's value to one's family. But I think a second source of stigma um, that's maybe more hidden but equally um, uh, uh, powerful is um, stigma about Asian Americans from outside the community. So there's something called the model minority stereotype, and it's, it, you may be familiar with this just by spending some time in America, um, but Asian Americans are sort of stereotyped as being highly successful, working hard, 
um, keeping their heads down and not complaining. And what that stereotype does is it reduces um, Asian Americans from being people that are allowed to have emotions, that are allowed to have issues, that are allowed to complain to a very limited um, way of being, right? They can't complain. They can't have emotional issues. They can't have mental illness. And so there's uh, so I think it's important to specify that there's two sources of stigma here, both within the community, but also outside the community that sort of reinforces this stigma. So what can we do about this? So uh, here I provide three ways, there are many more, but uh, three ways that we can all fight mental health stigma for Asian Americans, but for, for everyone. Um, and the first is to challenge stereotypes about mental illness. So if you overhear, you know, oh, I don't know about um, dating this person. I found out they have depression. Um, challenge that. You know, actually, you know, with treatment, depression is uh, people live very happy, successful lives. Um, the second point, though, is to challenge stereotypes about Asian Americans. So if you overhear, for example, oh, you know, this person works so hard because they're Asian, challenge that. You know, if you, if you overhear that, say, hey, no, it's not because they're Asian Americans, it's because you know them and they know, you know that they work hard. Um, but the third way, and I think, and I want to spend some time on this, is to talk about it. So if you have experiences with mental illness, or if you know a loved one, or, um, or if you just want to talk about sort of living mentally healthy, taking care of yourself, talk about it. Because the more we normalize talking about mental illness, the, le the, the quicker stigma goes away. Some of the best research we have suggests that um, uh, the fastest way to dispel a stigma is something called contact, which is the contact between the stigmatized group and the sort of majority group, if you will. And so, um, so the more we talk about it, the more we normalize it, it's going to fight mental health stigma for Asian Americans, but it's going to fight mental health stigma all over the place. And so that, that's, that's, that's the number one thing I want to emphasize. Okay, so I've talked about stigma as a source of, um, of, of, of why Asian Americans don't present to care. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is something I'm calling cultural mismatch. And um, to help me make the point, I'm going to uh, cite two respondents to a study that was done sort of querying why Asian American college students uh, don't present to care, and, and um, in their own words. So the first respondent says, I'm not depressed, but if I was, I would not even think about professional counseling. It's not even in my set of available things to do. You know, I would think about like friends or sleep or something, but I wouldn't even think of professional counseling. Um, so, and the second respondent says, back home, therapists don't even exist. People don't wanna pay money to talk to somebody. They want free counseling. So that mentality coming to this country, knowing that there are professional psychologists and therapists that you can go to, it's just a mindset that is not there. And I think what these respondents are getting at, these Asian American college students, is that there's just, there's not a mental model for, um, for mental health treatment for Asian Americans. And a lot, and it makes sense for, and it's for good reason, because, um, you know, uh, mainstream sort of mental health treatment is sort of a newer thing, even in America. And so in Asia, it's definitely a very novel thing. And so it's not really in one's minds, particularly in immigrants' minds, Asian Americans' minds, that, um, that, that emotional distress, that anxiety should be helped with mental health treatment. It's just not an idea. And just to make, to reinforce the point, so here I have some exa an example of how someone might present to mental health care, right? So someone experiences anxiety or depression, they say, hey, I'm not feeling well, something's not right. And so maybe they think, oh, I should go talk to someone about it. So they talk to someone about it and maybe there's a decision out of that conversation that they should go and present to mental health treatment. For Asian Americans, there's the, 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 the idea is that, the, that that last thought bubble, I should present to mental health treatment, isn't isn't in mind. It's not on the tip of one's tongue. And um, so for that reason, um, I, uh, I want to sort of emphasize just for any, any folks in the community out there who are wondering, you know, for friends or themselves or for family, like whether you should see a mental health clinician, here's, here's some criteria that you might consider. So number one, before I, before I say that, so mental health treatment is perhaps 
um, in the United States at least, more accessible than it's ever been because of um, all the transitions that providers are making to telehealth. Um, this is the time to go to mental health treatment actually. So uh, just to make a plug for, for, for seeking treatment and seeking treatment now. Um, so for Asian Americans, I think there might be this idea that mental health treatment is just for quote unquote severe mental illness, right? Like you have to be really sick to, 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 to get mental health treatment. And I, I wanna dissuade people of this notion today. Um, if you are not feeling right for two weeks, that is sufficient to go and, and seek mental health treatment. And when I say not feeling right, I mean things like if you're not, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling low energy, if you're feeling changes in appetite, if you're having difficulty sleeping, trouble getting to work or class. Um, and I think the thing that I wanna emphasize here is that two weeks, uh, I, I think, I imagine some of you might be thinking, wow, that's not a very long time. And my, my point is exactly, you know, um, two weeks, there is no harm in going to see a mental health clinician. And at the end of it, it might say, they, the clinician might say, oh, you know, uh, let's, 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 let's keep an eye on this, but, but I don't think you need treatment right now. That would be good news. Um, but really uh, not feeling right for two weeks. That is, that, that is the bar um, uh, one should consider treatment. If you are experiencing thoughts of suicide or if you have a family member or a loved one, that is a mental health emergency. That you should go to an emergency room to seek immediate care um, because that, that is something that, that, that um, cannot wait. Okay. All right. So I talked about how for, for some Asian Americans, there, there might not just be this idea in one's mind about seeking mental health treatment in response to distress. But I would argue that's not where the mismatch ends. It continues into the therapy room. It continues into the consulting room. Um, and if you take a step back here, um, just like I said, sort of Asian American culture is many different cultures. Um, uh, uh, um, Mainstream uh, mental health treatment also has a culture. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, so we, so mainstream psychotherapy comes from sort of a heritage of um, traditions from Western Europe dating back to Freud. Um, but we, but because of that, mental health treatment was sort of designed with Western Europeans in mind. And um, uh, that's a generalization, obviously, but 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 I think the sort of general principle is is, is important. Um, so mainstream psychotherapy culture also has with it its own assumptions. So what's one assumption? And I have one here. So what do we do when? What do we encourage um, people to do all the time? Talk about your feelings, right? How did you feel in that moment? Um, for Asian Americans, uh, that may not be as obvious an assumption. So for some Asian Americans. Uh, feelings, uh, it's not obvious that feelings should be talked about and that talking about feelings should lead to better mental health. Instead, oftentimes um, uh, Asian Americans, parents, uh, grandparents will encourage people if they're feeling distressed to do something about it, you know, to, to work hard in school or to do sports. Um, so this idea about talking about one's feelings may not be so intuitive. Okay, what else do we say in sort of psychotherapy all the time? communicate directly, right? So if you have a problem with me, I want you to communicate it with me directly. Um, tell me about what you're feeling about me, about, about, about your feelings, et cetera. Um, for Asian Americans, for some Asian Americans, um, uh, that direct communication, particularly about negative feelings about someone could be seen as a form of disrespect. And so oftentimes Asian Americans or, or Sometimes Asian Americans may sort of choose to communicate more indirectly, sort of with body language or uh, discomfort, looks of discomfort. So um, that's something to keep in mind too, is, is there's a tension. And by consequence then, um, I think mainstream psychotherapy, we often assume that sort of silence means agreement. Um, so if I give a recommendation and, 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 and the, the client is silent, I will say, okay, so the person agrees. Uh, in, in, in Asian American culture, silence could actually signal disagreement. So um, that's something for clinicians to keep in mind as well. And then finally, uh, I think there's an assumption um, uh, for psychotherapy that treatment takes time. 
right? So, and depending on the treatment you, you, you practice, the times could be quite different, right? So for psychoanalysis, it could take years. For CBT, it could be 12 sessions. Um, for Asian American culture, because I talked about how there's not um, a mental model for, for sort of psychotherapy, um, uh, Asian Americans may see uh, uh, psychotherapy as sort of akin to like an Eastern medicine session or um, a um, uh, treatment for a, a physical illness, right? And so there might be an expectation that I go to see the, the, the clinician, I get a medication or I, I get rapid treatment and I should feel better within one or two sessions. Um, so that's another sort of uh, assumption that, that, that should be fleshed out. Okay, so this is primarily for clinicians, but what are three ways to engage Asian Americans in mental health treatment? And number one, um, cultural humility. And I think, you know, this is something that as clinicians, this is something we do natural, naturally, right? As we, we are remain curious, we remain empathetic. Um, but I do wanna emphasize, I think, in particular, to remember that when we enter the, the therapy room, that um, we come into the room with our own assumptions as well. And um, I think at times it's easy to see sort of, um, uh, and I'm, I'm certainly guilty of this as well as a, as a clinician, where someone's not following with our treatment recommendations, I assume it's sort of because of resistance to the treatment or uh, ambivalence about the treatment. Um, it's important in working cross-culturally to keep in mind that it might not be sort of resistance to the treatment on the patient's part, but actually legitimate concerns about um, uh, whether or not this treatment model, the sort of Western psychotherapeutic treatment model is for them. And so that's something that, um, uh, that, that I think is helpful to keep in mind. Point number two, um, education in the therapy model, right? So as I said, it's this idea of sort of psychotherapy is not sort of, uh, um, yet mainstream uh, for some Asian Americans. So early psychoeducation about what therapy is, is very helpful. And, and very, basic, very basic education can be quite helpful too. Like, so how long is the therapy expected to take? When should one ex be expected to see improvement? Um, what is the role of a therapist? So these are some things that can be helpful up front in, 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 in um, treatment cross-culturally. And lastly, um, number three, this is more of sort of a, an innovative point here, but um, I, I think it, it, it's, it's helpful, I think, to, to think about this Western psychotherapy model, this, this model of uh, I work in the clinic and patients come to me as maybe uh, something that, that, that needs to be rethought for, some, some to, for outreach to some communities. So for example, uh, um, some experts have written that it might be helpful to redeploy mental health services to, um, to uh, Asian American church groups or to college campuses um, to think, to, wait, to, to, to decrease some of that barrier and to decrease some of that, um, um, to increase the sort of uh, uh, prominence of of mental health treatment and normalizing it. Okay. All right, so those are all the comments I wanted to make. Um, in summary, uh, low mental health access amongst Asian Americans is at least due in part to stigma and what I'm calling cultural mismatch. Number two, we all have a role to play in reducing the mental health stigma for Asian Americans and for all people. Number three, for community members um, who are listening here, the bar to present to mental health treatment is low. Just remember that, right? Two weeks. And um, clinicians should keep in mind their own cultural lens when seeing Asian American clients. Okay. All right, so let me see if I... Okay, so now I'm gonna switch it up for questions. All right, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I did wanna let everybody know that this is um, the Q&A portion. If you do have to jump off, totally fine. You can actually receive all of the questions um, in the recording, but also to keep in mind that um, if you are going to be submitting a question through Q&A, 
it is at the bottom of the Zoom webinar area. So you should be able to see it looks like a little chat box for Q&A. Um, so I wanted to start off by asking you, Jeffrey, a little selfish of me, uh, but I'm, mm. I'm not Asian American, but I have mm. several people both in my professional and social circles that are. How can I be a more supportive person in their life about mental health and approaching those conversations, especially if I know that they may be struggling, but I'm not part of the community? Definitely. Yeah, great question. Um, so I think some, um, some of the things that, in, 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 that I talked about in terms of reducing stigma for, um, for everyone, but in particular Asian Americans, right? So challenging negative stereotypes about um, Asian Americans, but also mental illness, I think is something that we all can do to sort of minimize some of that stigma and reduce that stigma. But I think the other point I'd like to emphasize that didn't come out as much in my talk, but is that um, normalizing mental health treatment um, and talking to folks. If, if, you're, if, if a friend of yours is saying like, hey, I'm not doing well, saying like, hey, have you thought about mental health treatment? Even that question um, uh, can plant in one's mind um, the idea of mental health treatment. And, and I think just getting, getting that idea to be a little bit more prominent uh, for Asian Americans can, can go a long way in, in, in helping folks access services. And I think that's helpful too, because especially if you're coming from a place of genuineness and if you can actually have that addressing face-to-face, -face, it, it comes off as being that you're not being dismissive and you don't want to hear about their problems per se, but that there might be a bigger underlying issue that a psychiatrist or provider might be able to help with. Totally, definitely, yeah. Um, so how can we talk to multiple generations about mental health and making families, particularly Asian American ones, especially if there are multiple generations living under the same roof? Um, how do you make it a more open space for this kind of dialogue? Do you think that it's possible? Um, and what challenges might people encounter? Yeah, that is, is such a great question. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll admit, I think that I, I as, I as a, a child of Asian Americans and, and, a, and a grandchild of Asian Americans still struggle with this, just because I think that there's, there, there is, again, just like a cultural mismatch, right? Like there's, there people are starting from different points of view, um, from different starting points. Um, one thing I would say is that I think that for sort of these big crucial conversations for people. I think there's this idea that it needs to be had in like this dinner table with all the relatives there and this very like, you know, it doesn't have to happen that way. <laughs> uh, oftentimes, you know, it, it, in these sorts of difficult conversations and broaching stigma in the Asian American community about mental illness, it's often easier to sort of find someone who you think is, is going to be more open to it. Like, you know, siblings, if you have them are a good place to start. Um, and then they can sort of serve as supports. And then you can go as a group to the people who are more difficult to convince. Um, I think it is, it is, it is so tough because as I, as I reflect on it, right? Like we should live in a world where seeking healthcare for um, an illness is not a controversial issue. Um, but, but alas, we don't. Uh, and I think because there's sort of a lot of misconceptions and old ideas out there about mental health being sort of distinct from the rest of medicine. But um, but that is, uh, yeah. So I think this idea of sort of divide and conquer, that's, that's one strategy that I've used personally. <laughs> I think it's always helpful to have those anecdotes too. So it's nice, to, it's nice to know that you've had some personal experience and some efficacy around that. Yeah. Um, so we did get a question from an Asian American clinician who sometimes worries about their ability to effectively work with Asian clients older than them since elders are considered wiser. Do you have any recommendations oh. for working with that population? Oh, what a lovely question. Um, yeah, that's tough. And, and, it, and, it, and it also brings up sort of, um, not to get sort of too psychobabbly or terminology heavy, but sometimes just working with Asian, like older folks that remind you of your family can put you in sort of a position where it, where it, where it becomes, um, uh, where it becomes difficult to sort of keep in mind sort of what the, um, I think, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I, it's going to sound sort of maybe like a cop out here, but I think continuing to sort of be curious, but also I think to um, make explicit 
um, sort of what one's, what the, what your patients or your clients um, model is for how they're relating to you, right? So, and, and um, this is going to be an uphill battle for people who, who um, may not be used to putting words to sort of ex explain um, relationship dynamics, but um, to the extent that you can, you know, sort of say like, hey, how do you, you know, I'm aware that I'm um, a younger Asian American, how do you see me? How is that going to affect our relationship going forward? And it, it may not, it may fall on deaf ears initially, but I think sort of planting those seeds can potentially sort of grow into something um, uh, and, and, and at least open up that conversation. So uh, switching generations, when thinking about opening up that conversation to others, do you have any advice or strategies that college counselors could use to appeal to Asian students to use mental health resources, especially since for a lot of the students, it is their first time being in America with a completely different culture? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, so I think I'll, the, the points that I made in the presentation about sort of being generally culturally humble, those are, those are general tips in the, emerge, uh, sorry, in the therapy room that are, that are helpful. But I think, um, I, I think I, I saw, I think it's run out of Harvard School, the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, groups that are focused, sort of like fo interest group focused groups. So like Asian American women, uh, Asian American college women running a group for mental health issues uh, for Asian American college women that can be such a that can decrease the barrier so much to mental health treatment because people there's sort of a shared um, cultural understanding a shared sort of um, uh, experience um, that that really helps diminish some of those barriers so thinking about ways to offer services in ways that sort of might um, uh, protect or uh, or emphasize um, those uh, experiences can be a big way to 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 minimize some of those barriers. And do you have advice for children of first generation immigrants whose parents are most likely experiencing a mental illness, but if the kids bring up the concept of treatment, they deflect? Mm. And I do have to say this is a challenge across all communities, but particularly yeah. Asian American. Yeah. I think so. And again, this, I think, um, so the, the ways I think in which we think about services for um, sort of the second generation versus first generation may actually be different. Um, so for second generation college students, they're, they're, because there's maybe a little bit more acculturation and, and more familiar with mental health services, the, 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 the foot in the door is a little easier. Um, but for first generation um, uh, 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 Asian Americans, um, there is some thought that sort of folding in um, mental health services into primary care and medical clinics is a is another way to sort of get the foot in the door. So if, if folks conceptualize like, um, this is just a part of um, my medical checkup, um, then it becomes that much easier to, um, uh, to, to, for them to sort of access services. So I, one example of this is the um, South Coast Community Center um, in Boston here. And it's like a, um, it's a clinic, a full clinic that sort of specializes in working with Asian Americans. But one way they've conceptualized this is to, to, fill, uh, to have mental health services in the same building as the primary care clinic. So that barrier is not there in, uh, um, to, to refer. So that's one way I think to engage it. So I, you know, to, to answer the specific question, how does, how do I get my parent into mental health treatment? That's a tough, it's a tough challenge, but sometimes maybe sitting down with the primary care doctor um, and having the primary care doctor say, oh no, this is just, this is just medical care. Um, that, that may be a way to engage, um, engage folks. So if a family doesn't believe in mental illness at all, how can somebody be more forthcoming with them about concerns without being feeling like they're at risk of appearing weak? Wow. I know wow. we got a lot of hard questions for yeah. you today. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that is tough. And I, I, I just, I guess my heart goes out to whoever wrote that question, I think, because it sounds like they're dealing with a lot. Um, Yeah. 
I mean, I think that, you know, uh, one has to, I guess, I guess, I mean, there are really, there are only really two things you can do, right? You can either try or stop trying. And so you try and you do the things that you can do, right? So you have those conversations that are difficult and maybe they don't go well. Um, and then at a certain point, um, if you feel like the divide is too large, then it's like, I don't know if there's much you can do at that point. Um, uh, so that, yeah, that's, that's, that's tough. But, you know, I also, I do have some hope that even though, you know, while the conversations, um, you know, and I'm speaking from my own experience here, so this, this may not map onto the sort of the, the, the person asked the questions experience, but um, sometimes um, uh, having that conversation initially, uh, it goes terribly. And then, um, uh, you know, I, I was surprised like six months later. So I'll speak, I'll, I'll, I'll share, share a, a little story um, about sort of my, my own experience. So um, when, I, when I talked, when I discussed with my parents the, my desire to be a psychiatrist, that um, was, uh, it was a tough conversation. Um, and it was, I was met with a lot of sort of like, are you, uh, that's not real branch of medicine, sort of a, a version, I think, of the stigma that folks with mental illness sort of translates into some of the stigma that mental health clinicians face um, about sort of why would you want to treat, treat, treat those folks, that sort of thing. Um, but what was amazing is, is I said, you know, I do. And, um, a f you know, a few months later, you know, my, my parents sort of totally changed, changed their opinions on, on treatment. I was really glad to see like my dad who, um, at his work was talking about mental. So I think, um, there, there's a way in which, um, um, sometimes these conversations, they, they are so difficult and they don't go well. And then afterwards, um, there may be some sort of uh, upshot of 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 of, uh, of a change in perspective, and um, I guess I, I'd hope that this that this this question, the person who asked this question, would experience that as well. So, if an Asian American is preparing for a counseling session, how would you prepare them if they don't understand necessarily how it works? And the person who asked this question said, quote, the therapist asked me what seems to be the issue or problem, but if I knew what my problems were, I wouldn't be here. Mm. And can you say that one more time? So, how would you prepare um, sort of an Asian American new to therapy? Yeah, so if they don't under, necessarily understand how a counseling session would work, and the direct quote is, the therapist asked me what seems to be the issue or problem. If I know what my problems are, I would not be here. Mm, yeah, okay, got it. So it actually, that's, that's a, that, it, it's a nice question. It sounds like it's a, maybe two questions, actually. The first question being, how do you prepare an Asian American for who's new to therapy? But then the second question, how to navigate sometimes when there's a sort of a, attention in the, in the, in the, in the therapy. Yeah. Great questions. Um, so, um, so therapy, the thing that the thing that's tough about therapy is that there are a lot of different kinds of therapy. So it's hard to say that there's sort of a one size fits all, but generally speaking, therapies are to help with sort of symptoms and the therapies usually take some amount of time. Um, so Unlike sort of, uh, you know, if you take a medication or, or something like that, there's not an immediate fix oftentimes to, um, uh, uh, to, to therapies. And so they, they take time. Um, generally speaking, though, some of those principles, but generally speaking, uh, most therapists will ask you sort of what your goals are for therapy. And that's usually forms the starting point for for, for therapies and how, how the therapies evolve. Now, um, I think that gets to the second question a, a little bit though, which is what happens when, um, when it's hard to put words to those goals? Um, and I, I think, you know, this is something that uh, therapists who um, you are going to work well with will be able to help you put words to. Um, so, 
um, it may be the case that um, that after an initial session where it's like, oh shoot, I don't know what my goals are, that therapist might work with that 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 client to sort of tease that apart over a couple sessions to sort of at least form form a starting point. It may also be the case though that some of that tension that the the, the person asking the question was experiencing uh, might um, uh, might indicate that there's some other tension going on, um, either cross culturally or something, and and it may indicate that 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 therapist might not be the best fit. And so, so I think that keeping that in mind, that if a therapist doesn't work out, um, that there are plenty of other therapists out there, and and finding that fit is very helpful um, in um, uh, feeling comfortable. So you had mentioned cross-cultural navigation, especially when working with a therapist or trying to find the right one for you. What do you perceive to be the biggest mistake that white clinicians make when working with Asian American patients? Mm. So I think my perception may not be sort of statistically, I don't have the statistics to back me up, but my sense um, is that uh, there can be issues with regards to, um, we were talking about treatment goals earlier. There can be conflicts when it comes to sort of a shared understanding of what those treatment goals are. So I think a classic example, right, is, you know, um, an Asian American patient who's 45, like comes in with a lot of anxiety related to um, feelings that he's not, um, uh, he's sort of a disgrace uh, because he got fired, for example. Uh, and he not only is disgraced to himself, but he's disgraced to his father. And um, I think from sort of a like, um, sort of Western psychotherapeutic lens, that assumption that um, uh, there's an assumption actually in sort of Western psychotherapy is that in general, as we grow up, we separate from our parents, right? Um, in Asian American cultures, that's not, um, that, that's not as, as, as much the case for some cultures. Um, and so uh, so, it, 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 so it's very easy, I think, to fall into the trap of saying, you know, oh, you know, like for that 45-year-old guy saying like, well, why do you care about your dad's opinion so much, right? I think the more culturally sensitive question would be to take that as a given to say, um, uh, you know, this guy, the, the sort of culturally respect of one's parents is very important. And so it's not going to be about changing that um, issue, um, but working around how, how to rethink, you know, are you really a disgrace for having lost your job? Are you really uh, displeasing your father? Um, but taking that sort of um, the cultural assumption to be a given, um, that I think is a little bit more culturally sensitive. So a lot of what we've talked about in terms of psychotherapy and seeking mental health, they're really based around Western culture. Do you see any effective counseling theories or practices that are emerging that are more Eastern influenced? Yeah, so this is like a really um, emerging area of research right now. And I, I was just seeing that they're um, actively adapting sort of mainstream psychotherapies to um, to be more culturally sensitive. So the studies that I was looking at were looking at working with Chinese Americans um, and adapting CBT to make them more sort of um, um, sensitive and adapted to the working with that population. Um, it is definitely an emerging field. And the way that they did that actually, that study was to, to, it, to work very closely with community members and stakeholders to develop uh, to see which concepts applied and didn't apply. And I think it's going to require that level of sort of cultural sensitivity and awareness to adapt mainstream treatments to, um, to those to, to, to cultures so that, um, so that, you know, uh, so that we're not sort of bringing our own assumptions to the work. So one clinician actually wrote in talking a little bit about those cultural specifics saying, I hate to admit it, but many older clients are inclined to cling to superstitions or potions. Do you have suggestions to address mental health with a patient like this? Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, 
So I think in those situations, um, the general recommendation is to try and work around it as best you can. Um, and I think that's probably a general principle here too, which is that um, it's probably best not to challenge culture um, uh, because I think that's gonna come across as sort of an affront, particularly, um, uh, um, uh, particularly because I think the therapist already has a lot of power in the room. And so um, to the extent that one can, if it's not sort of interfering with treatment or if it's not sort of um, uh, dangerous from sort of a physical health standpoint, I generally try to work around it um, and then uh, work with whatever's remaining um, to, to, to see what, 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 I, what, what I can do to be helpful. Um, we did actually have somebody ask about, and I'm curious about this as well, in today's climate, I'm worried about being offensive, even when approaching with the best intentions. How can I be culturally sensitive without coming across as being stereotypical? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is, this is a lovely question, because this is sort of a central tension of the talk, I think, that I, that I just gave, right? Like, you know, Asian Americans are a racial group, but we're actually talking we're talking about them as if they're a monolith, but there are just so many different cultures and how do you avoid, and I think that, I think that we're gonna make a lot of mistakes <laughs> in talking about this uh, and we're gonna offend people and we, have to, and we have to reckon with that and we have to apologize for it and sort of, um, uh, I think in the process of offending someone, you actually learn something, right? You learn something about their point of view, you learn something about yourself too. And I think that that process of, 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 um, of offending and then coming back is so important uh, to psychotherapy, but, but also um, to, you know, being a, being a, a human being in society. So when examining things like possibly being culturally offensive or trying to just carry on a dialogue with a patient, um, I know that you had mentioned regarding silence as either being possible agreement or disagreement. Mm -hmm. Is it common for Asian American populations to be expected to verbally affirm beliefs or values with others? Can you say that one more time, Jen, the last part? Yeah, is it common for Asian Americans to be expected to verbally affirm beliefs and values with others? Yeah, there is um, the, the way, and I, I'm hesitant because I don't want, I guess, people to walk away with this thinking that every Asian American client by being silent is going to be sort of disagreeing. I think it's, it depends on a lot of factors, but I think it's something that I, I do want to put out there just so people are aware of um, when they're in the working with this population. Um, it's hard for me to say sort of globally whether or not um, there's an expectation that everything is confirmed. There are some things that are sort of, um, silence sometimes means agreement, um, uh, but sometimes silence also means, um, okay, I understand your point of view, but I'm gonna do my own thing. So it's, it's uh, silence is just very, I think, meaningful. <laughs> Uh, just speaking from my own experience. And so I think it's, it's helpful to, if they're silent, to sort of actively um, understand what's going on for the client in that moment. So if you're working with an Asian American, is the treater's background important to establishing a, an alliance between the patient and the provider? If I'm working with an Asian American client, should I sort of disclose my background? I don't know. I mean, it depends, I guess, on the therapeutic the, the kind of therapy you're working in. Um, the thing that I think is important is to acknowledge that it's different. Um, so, and I think this is sort of one of the, the best, one of the nicest questions that I, that I, um, that I came across that I now ask in, in my intakes um, with new clients is, um, Sometimes there can be misunderstandings that happen um, when, um, the, when a patient and a psychiatrist are working from a different background or a client and a therapist are working from a different background. Do you have any concerns about that? And so acknowledging that, um, that you may be different from the client is often helpful because it, 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 and it may actually, the question oftentimes when I ask it doesn't go anywhere, but then a few sessions later, it will come up again. And, and I think it gives people license at least to talk about it and talk about those differences. So I think acknowledging difference is a nice, is, is certainly helpful. I don't know if 
I, I wouldn't necessarily get into the, all the details of my own background um, um, as a matter of routine care. Totally understandable. Um, so in different Asian nationalities, could you speak to hierarchies among them? We did have a clinician who wrote in who is Filipina, who says that sometimes clients that identify as other Asian nationalities seem to just directly dismiss her Asianness, meaning that their cultural values are, quote, more Asian and more highly valued than uh, yeah. what they perceive hers to be. Yeah. And I yeah, do want to say that that's an incredibly difficult question. So thank you for asking it. And I'm really sorry that you have to go through that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I think this is something that as an aside, sort of Asian Americans, Asian American, the Asian American community sort of has to reckon with, which is there is, uh, I think, sort of an undercurrent of there being, you know, um, a racial hierarchy. And I think it has a lot to do with like, who's the lightest in skin tone. And, and I think it's sort of a, it harkens back, I think, to sort of the, the racism and, um, uh, and, and I think how, how coming to America, a lot of immigrants internalize that system very quickly. And so I, yeah, I, I, I don't have an answer to that question beyond to say that it's something that we as, uh, see sort of we as an Asian American community have to work on and it's making it more inclusive within the community as well. Someone did ask, how do we bridge the gap between parents and adolescents in relation to treatment goals? For example, first generation parents focused on school performance, but adolescent is struggling with suicidality and depression. Mm, wow. Yeah. What a, what a powerful question. Oh. Yeah. We didn't make I'm it easy for you today. Yeah. And I'm imagining that, um, you know, this is like they're working with their therapist and the, um, the teenager is sort of experiencing these symptoms, but then the parent is also involved. And so how do you sort of come to an agreement about what the shared treatment goals are? That is tough. That is tough. And I think, uh, and without knowing a lot more about the situation, I think it would be helpful to lean on the clinician in that sense, in that setting, to help the the the, the patient sort of give voice to what they have their their concerns are, as well as sort of help the parent give voice to sort of what what their goals are as well. Um, but that is a tough tough situation. Um, is there any role that social status and hierarchy play in recommending that somebody seek mental health treatment? Um, and are there any barriers to overcome that are related to connecting somebody to mental health services? Yeah. So this is a, another idea that, I, that I've come across in the literature, actually, which is to, when thinking, rethinking mental health services, is that if you have sort of someone who has, has a lot of stigma about mental health, or has a lot of stigma about treatment, engaging that person's family um, and sort of convincing that person to seek treatment can be often very helpful. So the, the model I saw, and I thought this was so cool as a way of like thinking about things, but the, it was a social worker trying to engage a patient. Um, and what they did is they, they talked to the sort of family elder and sort of pitched it to the elder about like how, why this was so important to them. And then by virtue of that brought, brought brought that patient into treatment. So um, totally, yes, I think it, there's definitely a place for social hierarchy. And if you have like a, you know, uh, uh, you know, grandparents who are mental health conscious, that, I mean, that's, a fan, that's that, that would be uh, one, a huge sort of uh, asset, I think. I'm going to end on this question just because we've only got two more minutes. Um, so last but definitely not least, how can one remove the stigma of what the stereotypical ideology of Asians is when it's so embedded within the Asian population? And the second question mm. in this is, do you believe the average non-Asian developed the stereotype by way of Asian behavior to display the portrayal of being rigid educationally and emotionless? Say that last part one more time, Jen. Sure. So the question is, the second question was, do you believe the average non-Asian developed the stereotype of Asians by way of Asian behavior of displaying the portrayal of being rigid emotionally and uh, educationally? Mm 
Yeah, there's a lot I could say about this question. I think the only thing I will say, though, about it is that this idea of a model minority for Asian Americans was an invented idea. And it was um, an invented, it's actually, it's a fiction developed in sort of the civil rights era um, to sort of discredit the civil rights era. So there's a lot of history behind why this idea came to be. But um, if you're interested, there's a book called Colors of Success um, that talks about how the model minority stereotype came to be. And then actually, in, in addition, if, if folks are interested, there's also a PBS documentary um, called Asian Americans that talks a lot about the history of, of, of sort of how these stereotypes came to be. Um, uh, and it's, it's fascinating. I think pre-1960s, Asian Americans were not seen in this way interestingly. So, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to, to think about. Jeffrey, thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us to talk all about Asian American mental health. Clearly, there is so much that we do need to address. And while we've covered so much, I feel like we've really only scraped the surface. So thank you so much for all of your time, input, expertise, and compassion. And to all of you tuning in, thank you so much for joining. This actually concludes today's session. Until next time, be nice to one another, but most importantly, be nice to yourself. Thank you and take care.